Join us Sunday, February 27th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. for Camp Big Church. We'll spend the afternoon with your child and help them understand the importance of church and how to be in worship. Join us today in the atrium as we continue our Adult Sunday Morning Class Open House. This is the perfect opportunity for you to get to know some of the different Sunday classes we offer and find the best fit class for you. Grief is a unique journey that affects each and every one of us at some point in our lives. And it's good to know that we're not alone. And if you'd like help understanding your grief, join us for a six week in-person grief support class based on texts by renowned grief counselor, Alan D. Wolfelt, Understanding Your Grief. And we are thankful to have you in worship with us this Sunday, and we hope that you continue to walk with us on our mission of loving God, serving others, and transforming lives here at Christ United. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you on a beautiful Sunday morning in February. My name is Chris Dowd. If I don't know you, I'm the senior pastor here at Christ United. And there's just one thing to mention that Alex did not cover in the announcement video, and that is that Lent is actually 10 days away, believe it or not. So a week and a half from today is Ash Wednesday. You can go to cumc.com slash Lent to see uh, all the things that we're offering, the studies, and sign up for the devotionals and all that kind of thing. We'll be talking more about it next week, but I wanted to go ahead and get it on your radar. We'll have two Ash Wednesday services. 6 p.m. will be the family service in Underwood Hall. 7 p.m. will be our traditional uh, Ash Wednesday service here in the sanctuary. Uh, and I think that's probably it. If you would please rise in body or in spirit, we'll call ourselves to worship. Good morning, I'm Reagan Gilliland, pastor of adult discipleship here at Christ United. And since you're already standing, why don't you join me in the call to worship this morning. As we come together to worship today, we recall the story of Ruth, the stranger in a strange land who was welcomed. A woman with no resources who was provided for by the community. As we consider Ruth's journey, we pray that we too will find welcome when we need it and that we will extend that welcome to others who are in need. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we join together in our opening hymn, number 158, Come Christians Join to Sing.
good morning. I'm Mike Flynn, pastor for Care Ministries here at Christ United. I invite you to join me in the Apostles' Creed as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. may be seated and now we'll have our children's time video. Definitely. Doing it now. Okay. Bye. Sign that. It's approved. Perfect. One of the best parts about my job is that I've been here long enough to know exactly what to expect at every moment of every day. My days are really busy, don't get me wrong, but they're entirely predictable. For example, here in a couple seconds I'm going to be getting an email, and if I'm not mistaken, this will be followed closely by a package delivery. <gasps> email? Package. I just love routine. It makes it so much easier to know what to expect every second of every day. Like, for instance, my alarm is going to go off here in a couple seconds to tell me it's time to get my son from preschool. In three, two, one. Told ya. My day is so predictable, I bet I could do it blindfolded. Actually, see, I know exactly which steps to take every step of the way. Oh, that didn't feel good. This is not normally here, what is this? Urgent for Reverend Reagan Gilliland. Uh, all right, well, that's somebody else's problem. Oh, I'm gonna let them handle that. I got things to do. All right, and now we're gonna go to childcare, just like we always do. And here you go, Miss Jenny. Oh, but it's Thursday, which means I need to sign the birthday card. Exactly. Uh, Thank you. All right, okay. All right, well, there it is. Another wonderful, busy, gratifying, routine day in the books. Now time to go home. What? Why is that still here? Well, I guess I can call her. Hey, Meredith. Hey. So I have this like giant box down here. Um, yeah. It's got your name on it. I don't know. I don't know if you know what it is. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It is my vintage 1979 Chuck E. Cheese animatronic head. Uh, we're doing the nursery theme with uh, animatronic heads. So nice. Oh my gosh. Cool. Okay, that's odd, strange, but that's fine. Um, well, you know, if you need it, I could like bring it by your house after work, if that would help. No. That, that would be great because, you know, it's getting really hard to lift things. And I, did, I honestly didn't even think about how I was going to get it home. So um, I know you're busy, but that would really, that really mean a lot. So thanks for taking the time to Sure, off. sure. Yeah, okay. I'll put it in my car and I'll bring it by in just a little bit. Okay, just be really careful with it. You I, know, I, I will. It was hard to find. I will, I will. Okay, I'll see you shortly. Okay. Okay, bye. Wow, that was such a good reminder. I mean, routine is good, don't get me wrong. It's nice to know what to expect. It feels very comfortable, right? But 
At some point in all of our lives, we have felt uncomfortable. We have all felt vulnerable at some point. Maybe you've been the new kid at a school with no friends. I know I have. Maybe you've been picked last for a team. I know I have. Maybe you've been too shy to share your thoughts or your feelings. In these situations, sometimes all it takes is one person coming out of their routine, one person stepping outside their comfort zone, reaching out to make the difference in someone's day or in someone's life. It is so important that every day we look for these situations, we look for these people whose days, whose lives can be changed by one small, simple act of kindness. Remember, God is with you everywhere you go, and each and every one of you is a beloved child of God. Well, I have a very strange package to deliver now. I'll see you next week. So this is week two of our three-week sermon series on the book of Ruth. Last week we talked about chapter one, so we're going to uh, just recap that uh, real quickly before we get started today. We read last week about a uh, couple named Elimelech and Naomi who, because of a famine, uh, moved with their two sons from Bethlehem to the country of Moab. Elimelech died not long after moving to Moab, leaving Naomi a widow with two sons. These two sons married Moabite women, but after living in Moab for about a decade, both of the sons died as well, so that uh, Naomi decides to return home to Bethlehem. And when she does, she begs her daughters-in-law, her two daughters-in-law, to stay in Moab, to remarry, and to build a new life for themselves uh, in their own homeland. And one of the daughters does indeed stay in Moab. But Ruth decides to go with her mother-in-law, leaving her own homeland to build a new life in Bethlehem. And where we left off the story last week, the women had arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Ruth as a foreigner, both of them as widows, and both of them desperately poor, with no means of supporting themselves as they seek to rebuild their lives. That's where we're going to pick up the story. So I'm going to read the first two verses of the chapter now, and then we'll read uh, the rest of it throughout the rest of the sermon. Listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the author of Ruth. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, behind someone in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The world lost uh, a spiritual giant this past December with the passing of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, You're no doubt familiar with his work helping lead his home country of South Africa through the end of the apartheid era and the rebuilding of a more just nation. For his lifelong ministry, his many awards and honors included the Nobel Peace Prize, the Albert Schweitzer Prize for Humanitarianism, the Gandhi Peace Prize, and the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom. Well, Tutu said something that uh, resonates with the story of Ruth. I think. He said, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. (laughs) I love that sentiment. Overwhelming the world with good is part of our call as disciples of Christ, of course. But long before Christ, the main characters of the book of Ruth took seriously God's call for God's people to do good where they are. Last week, we spent a fair amount of time talking about the Hebrew concept of hesed, uh, which is a word that can be translated as loving kindness or faithful commitment. 
Uh, that term, the concept of chesed appears all throughout the Old Testament. It's the trait that God models in dealing with God's people. Uh, it's also the trait that we are called to share with one another. And in the rabbinic tradition, the book of Ruth is understood to be all about this concept of chesed, faithful commitment, uh, loving kindness. In chapter 1, we talked about how Naomi shows loving kindness to her daughters-in-law by urging them to start their lives over at home, not to go back with her to Moab. She wants what's best for them. She believes that that would be best at home, in their own homeland of, of Moab. And we talked about how Ruth shows loving kindness to Naomi by staying with her, by choosing poverty as a widow in a, in a foreign land rather than leaving Naomi to go home herself and fend for herself. And here at the beginning of the second chapter, we're introduced to the third main character in the book of Ruth, a man named Boaz. Now, we've talked about how uh, the names in this story are laden with meaning. Boaz means something like, in him is strength. And as the reader, in that first verse of the second chapter, we are told that he is a wealthy relative of Naomi's deceased husband. But as the, the second chapter begins, Ruth has not heard of him. She's not aware of a man named Boaz. In that first scene in chapter 2, it's between Ruth and Naomi, uh, Ruth takes the initiative to feed herself and Naomi through the practice of gleaning. It's a practice that we'll uh, talk about here shortly. For now, let's continue the story. So this is Ruth chapter 2, verses 3 through 17. So Ruth went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. They answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? Who's the new girl, he asks. The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she's the, the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, uh, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, <clears throat> now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, may I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoke, spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Amen. <clears throat> so archaeologists tell us that farming has been practiced in Palestine for almost 10,000 years. And just to put that in perspective, the book of Ruth, uh, which is one of our most ancient stories, was written about 3,000 years ago, so that by the time of the setting of this story, uh, agriculture had long been the foundation of Palestine's economy. In fact, uh, no human activity is depicted as frequently in the Bible as farming, beginning with the very first uh, chapters of Genesis. 
the practice of agriculture was central enough to community life to have been regulated uh, in the law of Moses. And of course, farming stories and agricultural imagery and metaphors figured prominently in Jesus' teaching. We talked last week about how the law of Moses identifies four categories of people for whom the community of faith um, must be particularly mindful, um, to whom we must be particularly attentive. Mosaic law commanded that God's faithful had to care for the widow, the orphan, the poor, and the stranger. Those are the four categories because they were the, the most vulnerable members of society, often with very little means of providing for themselves. And as we've said, uh, Ruth occupies three of those four categories. She's a poor widow from a foreign land. And this practice of gleaning, which you, you may have heard of, was one of the ways that the law of Moses addressed the needs of the most vulnerable. So in the law in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, we read, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 19, we read, when you reap your harvest in the field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. I know we know this intuitively, but it's, it's true that at the heart of our faith tradition, at the heart of our salvation history, is this concept of hesed. In dealing with God's people, God has continuously, over and over again, persistently shown us loving kindness, faithful commitment. And God's expectation is that we show loving kindness to others, so much so that it's commanded in the law of Moses. Almost a thousand years after the book of Ruth was written, when Jesus tells his disciples that the two great commandments are to love God and to love our neighbors, he's not being innovative. Uh, he's simply summarizing the law, the law, uh, the tradition in which he grew up, in a specific way that God's faithful are called to show loving kindness to each other is through this practice of gleaning, specifically leaving food in the field for those less fortunate. So in this second scene of the second chapter, it, we're focused on Ruth and Boaz. Now we as the reader know that Boaz is related to Ruth's deceased father-in-law, but when she heads to just kind of a random field, uh, she does not know who Boaz is, nor does she know that he owns the field where she's gleaning. Boaz, though, learns from his workers who Ruth is, and when he does, he begins to extend his loving kindness, his faithful commitment, uh, in ways that go beyond what the law requires. He tells her that she can stay on his land instead of moving from place to place, which is what would be expected. He promises that uh, he won't be she won't be harassed by his workers, who apparently were not always kind to the poor who were picking their food uh, after them. He tells her that she can share the workers' food and water, and he tells his workers uh, to allow her to glean among the, the sheaves, the standing food, and not just at the edges of the field, and he commands them to leave extra food for her. This is uh, Ruth gleaning by Mark Chagall. Now at this point, all Ruth knows is that Boaz is aware of the loving kindness that she's shown to Naomi. Uh, she does not know of their family connections as far as she knows. Boaz is being kind to her because she's been kind to Naomi. And she ends the day with what's called an ephah of uh, barley. It's about two-thirds of a bushel. It's a lot of barley. It's far more than she would have expected otherwise. Now, in the Jewish tradition, I love this fact, uh, the entire book of Ruth is read aloud in synagogues at the festival of Shavuot, which is the, the spring harvest festival. It's this annual reminder of God's expectations that we show the same loving kindness to each other that God shows to us. And here, there's just one other scripture that I want to mention. It's been said that in the Old Testament, perhaps the, the best summary of God's expectations for us 
can be found in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. I know many of us are familiar with that verse. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to love kindness and to walk humble, uh, and to, uh, oh, I missed do justice, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God, those three things. Well, the word translated as kindness there uh, is sometimes also translated as mercy, so that uh, we are called, we are commanded not just to be merciful, but to actually love being merciful. And uh, I'll give you three guesses what the word translated there as mercy is. The first two don't count. (laughs) Hesed. Hesed. This idea of loving kindness or faithful commitment, which is the the theme of of the book of Ruth. All right, let's finish this second chapter. This is uh, verse 17 through 23. Sorry, 18 through 23. So Ruth picked it up, that's the ephah of barley, and she came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And Where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women. Otherwise, you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen. I think there's tremendous wisdom and our Jewish friends reading this entire book aloud every year. And it seems to me that that reading Ruth can inspire us to take inventory of the, the ways that we show kindness to each other. When it comes to this biblical concept of loving kindness, how, how are we doing? I mean, I, I think it starts at home, seems to me. Are we generous with each other? Are we helpful? Are we understanding? Do we treat each other with kindness and respect? Are we slow to judge and quick to forgive? And then, uh, specifically related to the story that we're reading, uh, do we show loving kindness to those in need beyond the walls of our houses? Are we involved in service work or volunteer work of some kind? Do we support the ministries of the church? Yes, financially, but also through our time and our talents. When it comes to those in need, uh, do we treat them with kindness and respect? Are we slow to judge and quick to forgive? Does this biblical concept of loving kindness shape the way that we show up in the world, shape the the way that we show up on social media, uh, shape the way that we show up with those with whom we disagree? How much kinder a place would the world be if everybody Uh, made this central biblical concept a focus for the way we live our lives. The third and final scene of the second chapter uh, returns to Ruth and Naomi. This is when Ruth learns of the family connection to Boaz. When Naomi hears about Boaz, she blesses God for the loving kindness, there's that word again, that God has shown through Boaz's generosity, and we learn that Boaz is not just their nearest of kin, that's the word that, uh, or that's the phrase that the the translation I read uses, but it's actually in Hebrew a very uh, specific term to refer to a very specific position in the social system of their time. Uh, He's what's known as the family redeemer or protector. It was a specific title. It was a legal title, and it meant that Boaz was the one Uh, who was legally responsible for protecting the family's interests in the absence of the head of the household. Now that Elimelech is dead, Naomi is kind of on her own, Boaz's job is to make sure specifically that the land in the family stays in the family line of ownership. That's our, we'll read that next week. 
these two widows, through either uh, divine providence or, or happy coincidence, I'm just kidding, this is the Bible, it's definitely divine providence, <laughs> have found the person who can help secure their futures. Again, we'll talk about that land thing next week. On the podcast that Reagan and I do uh, this week, we, we talked about how in the Christian tradition, um, we don't really talk all that much about hesed, this, this concept of loving kindness. It's just not, I mean, it's a good concept. We should practice it, but that's not really a term that we use. And I think that's probably because, especially in our Methodist tradition, there's another word <laughs> that gets most of our airtime. I mentioned that in Micah 6, 8, it's sometimes, uh, hesed is sometimes translated as mercy. He has told you to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. But there's actually a, another Hebrew word that's translated as mercy. It's the last Hebrew word I'm going to throw at you, I promise. Uh, chen is the word. Chen is the Hebrew word specifically for grace, but it can also be translated as mercy. So hesed can be translated as mercy. Hen can be translated as mercy. And even though these two words are not precisely interchangeable, they are indeed closely related. And if, if loving kindness does not necessarily roll off the tongue, I mean, grace is certainly something that we talk about all the time. The book of Ruth is a story that begins in tragedy, to be sure. But through our Methodist Christian lens, it's really a story about how grace abounds. <laughs> grace abounds. The three main characters conspire to manifest the loving kindness that God has shown them, the grace that God has shown them. And when they do, Naomi and Ruth will emerge from tragedy and loss with a new sense of security and community and family. And when they do, they'll see in it all the hand of God, the gracious one who is the source of all grace and all goodness in the world. And friends, it seems to me that if grace is to abound in our world, as grace abounds in this beautifully told story, if that's going to happen, it's up to us to make it so. You know, last week I talked about how we all need church friends. Church friends are really important in our social network. I'm grateful that in my own world and in my own family's world, uh, it's full of grace and kindness. <laughs> and to me, that's, that's one of the tremendous gifts of living our lives in the church, surrounded by people who, whatever our other disagreements may be, certainly take this grace and kindness stuff seriously. But beyond the walls of our church and beyond the walls of our homes, we see plenty of examples of anger and division and mistrust and hatred and violence and selfishness and greed. We see so many examples of the opposite of grace, the opposite of loving kindness, the opposite of the way that God relates to us. But thanks be to God that as God's faithful, we know better than that. <laughs> we know to act better than that. Thanks be to God that we've put our faith in a Lord who commands us to show loving kindness, who commands us to be gracious with one another. Thanks be to God that grace abounds in our lives as God's faithful so that we might bear that grace to others. Thanks be to God that we live and preach a gospel that includes this simple but profound advice from a dearly departed spiritual giant. Do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Hmm. May it be so. Amen.
We come now to our time for prayers of the people. And before we pray, I mention that the flowers in the sanctuary this morning are given by Pat Heckel for all of our awesome Christ United musicians and in memory, loving memory of Pat Messick. And now after each prayer is read this morning, I invite you to respond with the words, Lord, hear our prayer. So let us go to God now in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for your presence here with us now and for each day that you grant us. Lord, may we always be mindful of your spirit of love and grace every day in our journeys with you. Lord, hear our prayer. We continue to pray for the unrest around the world, especially the escalating tension and conflict in Ukraine. Grant the leaders their wisdom in all their decisions. And may your spirit of peace and justice be over all people in their struggles wherever they are. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for our church, for our church's leaders, and we ask for your spirit's continued guidance and discernment in all of our missions and ministries as you make us witnesses of your love and peace to a broken and hurting world. Lord, hear our prayer. We remember and we pray for those who are facing illness, who are facing upcoming surgery, and for those who are still struggling with loss and grief in their lives. May they always know your comfort as we continue to reach out to them for encouragement and support. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray all these things in Christ Jesus' name, and we pray together now as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to a time where we uplift our tithes and offerings, but before, uh, I want to say we're, of course, glad that you're worshiping with us, whether you're in person or online, and we want to know that you're here. And so there's a few ways for you to do that. If you're in person, you can scan the QR code on the back of your bulletin. There are also some cards in the back of your pew that you can fill out and put in the offering uh, plate as it passes by. If you're online, if you're on Facebook, you can simply like or comment. And then if you're watching from the website, you can sign in. But it's a great way for us to stay connected, um, to know if there's any prayer requests or any pastoral needs. So the story of Boaz, um, and focusing on Boaz for this um, sermon today, I was thinking about how, you know, he had a lot of wealth, and um, he knew that he had a responsibility, a calling, um, a nudge to make sure that he was able to pass on that blessing to other people, to take care of others. And when I think about this church, so many of you have so many gifts, um, and it's such an honor to see you all use them, whether you know that, hey, I'm really good at finances, so I want to tutor someone through Project Hope. Or I really love kids, and so I want to serve on Sunday morning. Or I know what it was like to walk into a church and feel alone, but a greeter said hi to me and made me feel welcome. All of those go into a way of living this life of hospitality, of generosity, of love and grace, all the things that we hear about every week. And so we thank you so much for um, all the ways in which you are generous with your time, your gifts, and your talents, and the way that you show the love of God to this world.
please remain standing as you are able and join in the singing of our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, number 378, verses 1, 2, and 3. Be seated. I was telling Reagan, uh, <laughs> if you want to know how much of a Methodist preacher I am, Amazing Grace was sung at our wedding <laughs> for Whitney and I. It's, uh, oh gosh, I love that song. Uh, so if you have been visiting with us and have decided that today is the day you'd like to take your, the next step in your journey of faith, whether you want to learn more about the United Methodist Church or Christ United specifically, or you'd like to join, you can uh, leave the sanctuary and go straight ahead to, you to the Get Connected table, and there'll be a staff member there that can help you do that. As we go back out into the world, uh, hopefully inspired by this beautiful story in the book of Ruth, may we uh, be inspired to do the bits of good that we can in our lives trusting that God's grace will magnify that among all of us and overwhelm the world. Amen. <laughs>